Thanks, uh, Prof Khan, for uh, such a nice introduction. I feel very welcome to, to come here and present this uh, public seminar. Thanks for everybody for being here. <clears throat> so, um, uh, I will just give an overview of uh, some of the activities that I have been involved in at the University of Sydney uh, for the past two and a half years. And uh, begin the presentation of talking about Bayesian inference and optimization, then discuss landscape evolution models and the application to the Australian continent, then reef evolution models, paleoclimate reconstruction, and about open source software. Sorry, there's a typo here. It's paleo paleoclimate reconstruction over 250 million years instead of 500 million years. So, uh, uh, Bayesian inference, uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank Prof. Sally Cripps, who is the director of the Center for Translational Data Science. She was the one who kind of uh, talked me into becoming a researcher in Bayesian inference. Uh, she's a professor of computational stats and a good friend of mine and a collaborator. And with her help, I kind of uh, mastered the, this area. So Bayesian inference uh, is a principal approach towards uh, uncertainty quantification in free, free model parameters. Um, so some of you may know that uh, in machine learning, you have models and there are a number of unknowns in those models, such as a neural network. A neural network has weights and biases. Those are the unknowns and we need some type of optimization algorithm to kind of find those unknowns or estimate those unknowns, right? And you could use a gradient descent to estimate those unknowns, or you could use Bayesian inference to estimate those unknowns. The advantage of Bayesian inference is that it is, it is uh, probabilistic. Instead of you having a single value for an unknown parameter like for example, weight one in a neural network is 5.38. You will, instead of that, you will have a probability distribution that says that, you know, that weight or that unknown parameter is, uh, has a mean of 5.38 and a standard deviation of something. And uh, that is a, a more rigorous form of uncertainty quantification. So uh, the major, philosophy of uh, Bayesian inference is that based on some prior information, you update the value of the unknown. So in most problems, there's some prior information of the unknowns. And in this talk, I'm going to talk more about the unknowns in geoscientific models. And those uh, unknowns become more difficult to estimate when you have multimodal uh, surfaces also known as multimodal posterior surfaces. So Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling methods are a way of estimating those unknowns. They are kind of similar to optimization methods such as gradient descents uh, that, are, that is iterative and you construct, uh, you update some proposal for thousands of uh, iterations. Similar to in gradient descent, you update uh, your um, set of uh, uh, the current position based on some gradient information. So uh, Bayesian inference uh, is based on Bayes theorem and it uh, kind of uh, estimates the posterior distribution based on data and likelihood. A likelihood is uh, in the optimization uh, literature, it could be similar to a fitness function, for example. And uh, the prior is, as explained earlier, all the nouns there. Uh, prior is basically the assumptions that you have without looking at the data, just based on the model. And parallel tempering is a form of uh, uh, is a type of Bayesian inference where in case if you have multimodal uh, posterior surface or uh, your optimization surface is, uh, has a lot of ridges and valleys as shown there, your algorithm can easily 
be trapped in a local minima. Hence, you need a more com comprehensive way to explore the parameter space. And parallel tempering is one such approach that is effective in exploring multimodal posterior surfaces where you have a number of chains and, uh, or a number of replicas that are executed in parallel. So you could kind of assume, you know, that you are in a way, this is synonymous to executing gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent in several pores in your uh, computer, in a high performance computing. So it's similar to that, you have multiple MCMC -MC chains that are executed in different cores, and then over time they, are, they exchange the neighboring re replicas, the configuration in the re neighboring re replicas, so that you fully explore the posterior surface. So that is all, uh, that is the overview about uh, Bayesian inference and uh, sampling. So now going to the other group, uh, I'm also part of Ed Byte and uh, is Prof. Dietmar Müller, who is a former ARC laureate fellow and director of the ARC Basin Genesis Hub at the University of Sydney. And in 2017, when I started my fellowship at the University of Sydney, I had the opportunity to meet him and then he gave some talks and he told me what he's doing and things like that. And that kind of motivated me to change the direction of my fellowship from um, climate extremes to more from using machine learning for climate extremes, which I was already doing, to something uh, more unique, which is using AI and machine learning to understand the history, geological history of our planet and to unravel the mysteries in deep time. The reason I became more interested in his work was that he is also uh, uh, one of the promoters for open source software at the University of Sydney, open data, and more, more concerned about reproducible research. So these things kind of, uh, which I was also very much interested in, and I have been promoting these things uh, here in Fiji before even going to Singapore. So, so then I said, let's, let's just work together. And this is Tristan Sales, and he is the developer of the Badlands model. Badlands model is a example of a geoscientific model that tries to um, simulate uh, topographic development over time at various time and scales. So. Uh, for example, as you can see in the figure there, you have rainfall and then you have tectonic uh, drifts uh, uh, and then you have uplift and uh, the rise of the sea level. So over the millions of years, you know, the, the, the surface around us, the, uh, the rivers, the valleys, all those things have been changing due to these, uh, these environmental and geological forces that we have been taken for granted, you know. I mean, when we talk about climate change, one thing is we think about the atmosphere, but we don't think about the surface, the earth, you know. Uh, it has not always been like this, you know. For, for example, Viti Levu is, is relatively a very new island, you know. It is about uh, 45 million years old, relative to Australia, for example, which is probably uh, it has been there through the, uh, throughout history, uh, but uh, I will show you some simulations that show uh, how Australia kind of drifted apart from the Pangaea continent. So I think uh, it's to understand uh, landscape evolution models, it's uh, better that you see this uh, video. This is looking at Australia for past 150 million years. And Australia has been moving away from Pangaea. And at certain point of time, you know, see the middle was underwater for several million years. And uh, the surface, uh, this uh, coastline also changed and so on. And now 
this is the Australia that uh, we see after after 150 million years of evolution. So at 96 million years, a significant portion of Australia was underwater. And those parts make uh, most of the desert that you see that Australia has today. So these models, what you saw there was an output of the Badlands model. The Badlands model, Badlands model basically takes input parameters. The unknowns there are things like Precipitation for the last 150 million years. You have um, the sea level changes for the last 150 million years. And then you have other things like uh, the, the tectonic uplift and a wide range of other parameters, environmental parameters. Those things, the, the, the question is that some of them we know and some of them we don't know. For example, we do not know what is the precipitation rate for the 150 million years of our different regions in Australia. So that is why we need uh, an intelligent way of guessing that, you know, those are the unknowns. And then that, that is where artificial intelligence comes in. So Bayesian inference can be seen as a type of artificial inter intelligence methodology that um, will be used to find those unknowns. And what other data is there? We have data for the sediment deposits uh, for the last uh, I know 150 million years there's some form of data is there and then we have our present day topography so uh, and this is the team uh, Daniel is a research engineer with me and uh, Nathan is in the Sydney informatics hub and we have our a local collaborator here, he's not here now, but uh, he came, uh, Ratanil came over for an internship, and then he helped me develop some of these models. You can see that there's something in common with all these three guys, right? They, they look very happy, and you know why? Because they're working with me. <laughs> so I try to keep them happy. So we propose this baselines framework that uses Bayesian inference with the Badlands model, it kind of wraps Bayesian inference around the Badlands model to, to find the unknowns. And this is just basically a frame, framework. And on the top, you can see here that uh, it's about the prior beliefs. The prior beliefs are the, the knowledge from the experts about, for example, precipitation for 150 million years. What do the experts believe? They have some data, they have some, you know, guess there, which is better than having nothing, you know? So we take that into account, and then our goal is to get uh, the posterior based on evidence, which is the current data, such as the sedimentary uh, records and the present day topography. Essentially, the model should start from 150 million years, and evolved in the present day topography of the model should match our present day topography that we have now. And if it matches well, that means your model is accurate in understanding the past or simulating the past. So we, as you can see, the Badlands model is there and we try to propose new, uh, new uh, uh, parameters of the unknown, new proposals we call it, for example, for precipitation and erodibility. And then we try to either accept or de reject that as a solution. And the, the process continues as does in a, any optimization algorithm. The, the issue here, which I showed earlier, is that uh, uh, the, these models are very computationally expensive, very much computationally expensive. So that, that bad, uh, the model of Australia that I showed before, that took probably around 12 hours you know, to run, right? And the thing is that we need to kind of look at very small prob uh, more, uh, areas, not the whole of Australia first, to build this framework, and that's what we did. So the reason is because we need, to, we need to obtain, let's say, 10,000 samples of that model. And 10,000 samples 
of 12 hour runs because will become years you know so that is why we need to use high performance computing we need a smaller area to look at to show a proof of concept because nobody did this type of work before where Bayesian inference AI methods were brought in and married with the landscape evolution models so some of these uh, parameters are there that we need to estimate and this is kind of a uh, the figure that kind of gives an overview of our framework where we have a parallel uh, we have MCMCs or parallel tempering in a parallel computing frameworks where different cores have different MCMC chains and then there's interprocess communication and with that we explore the parameter space uh, better. So as I said we need a smaller problem so we got a smaller problem uh, where we look only not 150 million years, but we looked at only 1 million years. We obtained uh, 10,000 samples and we looked at 10 replicas that were executed in 10 processing cores. And our likelihood function looks at the landscape ele 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 elevation, which is the present day topography. And for the last million years to present day, the simulated topography that is compared and then the history of uh, sediment erosion deposition. So uh, one uh, special thing about the Badlands model is that, so there, has, there are dozens of landscape evolution models out there, but Badlands is like a product of our eight byte group. And it was developed by Tristan Sales in Python. And the major thing there is that it looks it is not looking only at the surface, but it also looks at what is underneath the surface, the, the way the depositions, you know, were uh, transported. So if you, for example, you know, you, you go anywhere you go, you dig, you will see some, some form of sediments, especially near the river, you'll see different layers of sediments. Now you have different type of soils. Those are things that are transported from the hilly elevated areas over time. So we look at uh, this area, which is a very beautiful spot, but unfortunately I have not been there. Although I, I did my PhD in Wellington, but people make fun of me for not visiting Christchurch, but I will do so in the coming years. Uh, so we, we, we look at this, this area, and this is how this area looks like. Uh, we, we kind of, we, the, the, the other issue here is what was the initial topography one million years back, but we don't know. So just as a proof of concept, we take the present topography, which is Christchurch, that area today, and we try to run badlands, basically evolve this, given some precipitation and some other input parameters. And after one million years, it will look like that, basically. So we have like a uh, simulation of this to show that can we recover the parameters that we use the synthetic parameters and show that the model works uh, one of the first things we did in this setup was to find out what is, what does the posterior surface look like so this is the the, the, the peak there that is the actual true value for the for the precipitation and the erodibility parameter. And uh, there are all these suboptimal peaks. So recall I was just saying that we need all these parallel replicas that are traversing the space. That means some of them will be traversing here, they are there, and all around the space. Some will be here, they all have to kind of traverse and go up there and kind of come somewhere near this, this space to find the, the solution that best describes the model with the data <clears throat> and uh, hence there's a set of local optima and global optima <clears throat> and uh, as I was saying about the sediments uh, in that space these are all the sediment deposition for the <clears throat> one million years and we look at the uh, certain points there that we compare those with our likelihood function. 
and then we see how well the model predicts the sediment deposition in those areas. So the blue is the predicted and the green is the ground truth. So we see that there's, um, and then the, the red era bar is the uncertainty quantification. And this is a example of one of the parameters. I believe it is the precipitation parameter. And this shows that all the 10 chains, how they were traversing in the different cores. And this is the basically the estimated posterior distribution. And the true value was 1.5. And we can see that uh, it's a bit uh, multimodal, but uh, one of the modes is around 1.5. And this is a cross section of that area. And you can see that there's the, the ground truth is there, what the badlands predicted, and then the uncertainty around it. And this is the major, um, uh, major contribution of Bayesian inference. So uh, as I said earlier, <clears throat> that uh, these models, these models have uh, a lot of difficulty because we need to run uh, thousands of, uh, thousands of uh, samples or thousands of models. And if each model takes one hour or two to run or six hours to run, then you know, it can be months till we get the sampling done. The other thing is that we do not have gradient information. So our proposals, the, the, the model does not give good uh, uh, Oh, there is no gradient information, so it's hard to have a well-informed uh, proposal. So hence, hence we also develop surrogate-assisted surrogate baselines, and the idea is that rather than at some, sometimes we, if, uh, so this is uh, running in a parallel computing framework. We, our software we developed from scratch, basically, and the idea is to use machine learning to try to. Uh, uh, to try to simulate the badlands model. So you make a surrogate of the badlands model and that surrogate is computationally cheaper. So rather than waiting for two hours for the badlands model to, to run for Australia, you give those parameters to the surrogate and the surrogate tells you how good those parameters are. So at times you use badlands, the actual model, and at times you use the surrogate model. So uh, these are uh, two other intents who joined in uh, 2018, Konak uh, Jain and Arpit Kapoor, and they helped me in the programming for those uh, uh, surrogate-assisted uh, baselines. And uh, this side we have uh, the computational time for the true model, and then how much of time is reduced uh, using uh, the surrogate-assisted uh, approach. And at times we also have better performance with the surrogate assisted approach. And here we can see how well the surrogate assisted approach kind of uh, compares, how it compares with the true model. So for example, what this means, this top, uh, what this means is that rather than waiting for 70 days, your job would be done around 40 days, you know. The computation in a high performance computing environment. This is more of a proof of concept. And then we have uh, the predictions, uh, and it shows that the surrogate assisted model is not so bad. So essentially, the framework is good to simulate uh, the sediment transportation and deposition from the source, which is the mountains, to sink, the delta areas. And we have this type of examples around Viti Levu. And these models can be used for that, to understand how Viti Levu was formed uh, in the last 45 million years. And uh, it could be used for big, large scale source to sink models, such as uh, uh, the Australian continent for the last 150 million years. We are about to complete this project. Uh, and, 
and working with some PhD students. Lauren Harrington did our honors in this area and Carmen Braz is doing a PhD at the moment around this area. So, um, and uh, what other advantages do we have? With making this, basically we have topographic maps for the 150 million years, which is going to be useful in further understanding how the continent evolved or how the islands evolved over time. And that could be very useful for more research out there. And there are all these other various applications, uh, you know, the surface process, catchment dynamics, and how these species, uh, you know, kind of evolve around these areas, and uh, how these uh, mountains, valleys, deltas were all shaped. Right, moving on to another topic. This is about using this similar approach for reef modeling. And uh, we present base reef now. And this is like one of the reef uh, assemblages there. And you can see here a diverse uh, coral reef, uh, um, you know, um, a snapshot. And one thing to notice here is that there are different types of corals there. And so these different coral assemblages, they produce different type of reef structures, you see, and they have different uh, components and they, they, they are good for, you know, they attract different types of species around them, different types of fish, they harbor, shelter, uh, the species around uh, these areas. And Fiji is uh, in the zone where there's a lot of coral reefs, and this zone here, you can see the number of species, more than 400 different species are seen in this zone here, you know, and the Great Barrier Reef is part of it. And essentially from, you, you see the South Pacific to all the way to, to Bangladesh, close to India, th this is the main uh, uh, place uh, for the most species. Now, so I'm not doing, uh, so that, that fancy research in here, this is very simple things I'm looking at. And this is a cross section of one uh, coral reef, uh, uh, coral reef uh, formation for the last, uh, you know, it could be, you know, up to 10,000 years. So basically there's a, there's a cross section here and there's a core, you know, it's a drilled core basically of up to 20 meters. And basically we, try to simulate the development of these reef structures for the last 10 or 15,000 years. And so what happens is these people, the people who study coral reefs, actually the history of coral reefs, there are kind of two different types of researchers in this area. One kind of they look at the history for the past, you know, 20, 30,000 years, how these reefs were formed. And these are the people who go there and drill make some boreholes to get data. And you can see here from this data, basically they try to find out which type of reef assemblage was there. Not that many different types, five or six different types. So Jody Powell, uh, she was my honors, uh, I was mentor for our honors thesis. And uh, she got a University of Sydney medal, which is one of the best awards there for the, pro uh, for such a, programs of studies and she worked in this area with me and with associate professor Jody Webster who is also the leader of the geocoastal research group which I am part of as well. So from the previous uh, this we get this you know so we, we kind of put all those course together they write papers about these things and they have written dozens of papers where they try to establish the history of the formation of coral reefs. And from one such paper of Jody, I think this was probably published in Nature, one of those journals, um, he, he tries to look at, you see, 22, the evolution of the reef from 22,000 years back and when the sea level was much uh, lower to how the reef kind of uh, adjusted or evolved in, inland, moved inland as the sea level rose. So there's, uh, there's a, in the last 10 or 20,000 years, there's a major change in the sea level. 
um, more than 10 meters for sure. So uh, based on the data, we take the data and we try to find out which different type of assemblage is there. And then there's a reef model also developed by Tristan Sales. This is called Pi Reef Co. Because of Reef Co, the Co is there. And because it's in Python, and uh, basically we uh, use a Bayesian inference approach to uh, a framework, similar framework as in Bayesian lands. We, we apply that and we, the, the model basically predicts or simulates which different type of assemblage was at which depth for the last 10,000 years. <clears throat> and we do a similar synthetic study where we try to see how good is our Bayesian inference approach? And we see that our predictions and, uh, is close to the data that we generated. And then we look into, we look at one of those reef cores, which is from one tree island, uh, OTI, and uh, which shows the different uh, uh, reef uh, assemblages, shallow, deep, water deep, and so on. And uh, we try to use PyReef Core to simulate that, and here we see that the model kind of predicts uh, some areas very well, and in some areas there's high uncertainty, and it's a very difficult area. We have about 52 parameters here, and what we are trying to find out in this is, um, in this uh, problem, is what water flow velocity was there for the last 10,000 years. And also what was the uh, amount of sediment input in that reef uh, area? Where well, you have sediment, but essentially means, you know, the, when the, it rains, then from the mountain areas, you have soil that kind of, uh, with water kind of comes in that area. And that a bit too much of it is not good for the reef, you know, they, they can die. And then also, very fast uh, sea level uh, rise, the reef can die again. It's called they are going to drown. So just uh, as if you go into the water, don't swim, you drown. Similarly, the assemblages also drown. And then there are other factors such as um, the, um, the, the temperature rise, drastic changes in the temperature. And uh, about a thousand years ago, there was drastic change in the sea level. And these things kind of cause immense uh, changes in the uh, environment and the climate. So one thing is we are looking at deep time up to 150 million years with base lens. And the other side, we are looking at not so relatively deep, but just thousands of years of the climate's history. And with this reef thing, we are looking at, uh, you know, you can have some, um, some knowledge that will be part of the uh, literature for coral reefs that will help uh, reef scientists to understand how these reefs survive and what can we do to protect them further. So for example, the shallow exposed assemblages are relatively insensitive to sediment input and flow velocity. So that means that there's certain types of corals, they will grow and survive although there's a lot of sediments in the water, basically. And deep assemblages have tighter environmental niches. So things like that. Uh, moving on to another project, um, running out of time, uh, is uh, paleoclimate reconstruction. Now I'm looking at the atmosphere, looking at, and also the land area, but more of the biodiversity. So this is uh, the late Cretaceous period, around 100 to 66 million years ago. You cannot, if you see it once, you're like, oh, it seems look, it looks similar to, to what it is now, but not really. You can see that there's parts of Africa underwater here. There's now, uh, you know, uh, Middle East around there. They are all underwater. And then there's India is... Um, here, you know, it's an island. So this is around that time, you know. And all of these were together as a big island, like around 250 million years ago, that was called Pangea. I'll show more of this. And this is uh, around 250, 40 million years ago. And one thing here is that the models are certain about where this, uh, you know, the, the continents were at what time. There's a bit of uncertainty around that. 
And Dietmar Müller, who I introduced earlier, he is a world leader in this area, and his ERC Laureate Fellowship was based on developing models around these things. <clears throat> and there's a software called GPlate, which simulates this. And this is a output of the GPlate uh, software here. And you can see that India and Australia at some point of time, they are close. And uh, India is going out, moving apart. They're kind of uh, not friends anymore. And then kind of India is like, Australia, you go ahead. I'll try to see what I can do for myself. And I want to make something which is uh, known. And that's what India collided with that uh, part. And that's when the Himalayan range was formed. And that's what is the main uh, uh, identification of uh, the, that, that area these days. So the maps that you saw earlier, they had these green parts and those brown parts and kind of shows deserts and so on. They are actually not really very comprehensively, you know, um, evaluated. They are more guesses by the scientists. So what I am doing is trying to use machine learning and available data there for the last 250 million years and try to reconstruct these forest areas. And you can see that 14 million years ago in Miocene period, there are, so what these, these data sets are mostly given by I don't know really how they got it, but probably it seems they got from the mining and the oil industry, right? So from there, they got all these data sets that show where are these coal deposits. Coal essentially means that those areas had forests, okay? So, and then we have data set for like this for different, uh, for, you know, 15 different data sets, something like that, till 250 million years. And here you can see, for the 51 million years. Uh, and our goal is basically to, to uh, use the available data and reconstruct. So in, in this data set, the, these areas basically, they are all missing data. And basically these areas here where you see that, it basically says where they, there was coal or there was not coal, coal deposit, right? So most of the areas are missing. And then there's like glacial data, which kind of proves that at that, that time zone, you had some, uh, these parts, these parts were all freezing basically, right? But you can see that you go back in time, 50 million, 51 million years, the planet was relatively hotter, you know? So the planet for the last 250 million years, the plates have been moving apart and that is the drastic changes in the temperature, different species came and different species went away. And then we, uh, this time it's kind of end of, you know, the, the, the Jurassic era, humans were not around then. <clears throat> so uh, this, uh, I don't have any results to show here, unfortunately. And uh, the other goal here is to kind of see how much of uh, how much of precipitation was there in these areas for the last 250 million years. And we are trying to also model that first. We try to mo model the forest covers. And then from that, we try to infer again with some other simulated data uh, out there about the preci precipitation. So, uh, so the conclusion on opportunities out there, there's a wide range of scope for geoscientific models. There's a wide range scope for using larger models and uh, also more unknown parameters. We are already looking at those things and how to improve this further is better proposal distributions and novel MCMC methods. And then we have machine learning can be used for other things, you know, for other environmental and climate uh, science problems and also data from the Pacific and me with uh, a few students here and researchers here, we were mostly looking at extreme events, cyclones with machine learning, but there's a wide range of other data sets and uh, those things we can look at. And then uh, my talk mostly concentrated on this, but I have other areas as well, which is mineral exploration 
and Bayesian machine learning and optimization. And I would like to have further collaboration with USB academics and students in the future. And just an announcement of this $11 million research center that we got, which will create opportunities for the next five years in terms of postdoctoral research and PhD scholarships. And I am part of this uh, center as well. So, uh, uh, and most of the things that I do, actually everything that I do is open source. And so you can see the projects, the code and so on. And all my research outputs are online. You can add me in the research gate. And the seminar presentation is also online. Vina Kavakelevu, Dhanyavad, and Namaste. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandra. It is very nice and uh, very interesting area of research. And I think you might have noticed that there are two important areas with uh, the tools used. And this research is the Monte Carlo MCNC, which is from statistics. And uh, we are uh, applied in the modeling for evaluation of geoscience in the area of geoscience. So I think this is very interesting area. Uh, I think we'll. Okay. Uh, open the floor now for two questions. Any questions? How do I collect the data? So, so the data collection so for different projects, right? So the the base lens, the landscape evolution project, the data is already available with Google uh, the topographic data. So we take the data of the present day topography and the data that is for what was there 150 million years ago, for example, for the Australian continent, that is uh, based on fossil records and it's very sparse and very limited. Same as the sedimentary deposit data sets for that, that area. So those are data sets that are published by Geoscience Australia. They are Kind of available in some of the papers it's all about getting those papers and that's this is why the collaboration is very important and the researchers and professors in that area they basically provide those things and in the reef uh, case basically jody webster who's the collaborator his group kind of goes that area and is also part of the drilling process uh, and so on and the other data set i think that's uh, Oh, that's also published uh, data set in the paleoclimate one, which is in the papers, and that's how we got it. Uh, no, uh, I think uh, uh, I'm not really sure about that. I think they have uh, this uh, specialized software, and from there they get the data, but it may be through Google or may not be through Google. But the thing is here, the point is that the topographic data that is available is of the present day. And the research is more about reconstructing the past topography data to see the evolution of the, the landscape. And that's what, uh, for example, Google will not have. <laughs> yes.
So maybe the extension of the more complicated models on which uh, try to see if they are suitable or not. So this is the first answer, the proposition of the possible extension in order to have a more complicated data more models. The second one is about the choice of the listing factors. We know that they are basically unidirectional in the sense that it's a difference from prior and posterior reduced effects. But we want to not more complicated models which use time in two ways. There are other different methods or the things that can use it. I imagine, for example, a possible bidirectional recovery neural network, an SDM bidirection, in the sense of modeling. Modeling, because you can see the evolution as a sequence in time sequence. So, another possible way of approaching the What do you think? Yeah, yeah, these are very good suggestions, actually. So, we, our, um, the first, uh, your first suggestion about having different points, uh, we are looking at that and we, we can work together on those things. And the thing is that uh, the, one of the projects is also to, that, that 1D model try to make it as a 3D model. So there's some work done on that area and also to do inference around that. But uh, then uh, because these models, uh, it's more of constraint parameter optimization and the constraints are very difficult for that 1D model. So although there's very limited data, but the model is also very difficult. So to extend that model is difficult. So I think your suggestion will be very useful, you know. And then the second one is, uh, we have uh, discussed that uh, about, because I, I'm also a deep learning researcher and looking at patient neural networks. So, so uh, th that can be a bit tricky because uh, these, these uh, model outputs, there's like, you know, it is basically producing topographic maps. And then you will not be able to have recurrent neural networks or you know, convolutional networks or conversion recurrent neural networks to produce those, you know, because Okay, it's I mean something to something to discuss. Yes, it's a. It's, thank you. Your your comments are also very helpful. Thank you, thank you very much, Robert, for your, your your kind comments. I recall our poetry reading sessions, you know, back ten years ago, probably. <laughs> um, this is a very uh, important, uh, valuable suggestion. Actually, we are we are looking at past 
40,000 years of PNG, evolution of PNG in one of the projects. And then the other project is looking at uh, how PNG and Australia kind of separated in the last 20 million years. And how, so that's kind of bringing the G plates model and this bedlands model together. Uh, probably that will be done by next year. And I think that, uh, th that the purpose of me giving this presentation is to kind of bring this type of research to Fiji, you know, and like let our students and researchers start thinking about doing these things for Fiji. And what you're saying for 15 or 20,000 years, we'll have more detailed maps, you know, about, uh, uh, for example, the Singatoka sand dunes, you know, how they came about We've seen parts of uh, the, the island was underwater at certain points of time as well. And those things uh, can be simulated uh, and this opens a whole uh, a wide range of opportunities for, for research students here. The other thing is that uh, this research is also very unique to Australia. And Australia is uh, primarily, uh, the industry is mining there. And that's why on my other side, the research is also about mining and this uh, evolution of the sediments and uh, deposition also kind of tells you where the minerals are and where you can get uh, copper and gold. And we are doing other uh, work that is trying to uh, simulate and find where to drill. I, where to drill, I know sounds really bad these days because you have this whole oil industry and pollution, but we cannot get rid of where to drill issue in the future. We are going to get rid of the oil for, for energy, but we will need the minerals we need the, the resources because your mobile phone, for example, is a product of the mineral uh, exploration. You know? The battery there, all the, the copper there, the gold there in the phone that makes technology possible. So mining is going to be there in the future and there can be potential for mining in this uh, uh, island as well. And there already is, but it's all about doing it the right way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think no more uh, questions. Uh, uh, I think uh, let us thank uh, uh, Dr. Raita Sandra. It is